Hello. Hello, everybody. All right. Well, thanks for coming, everyone. Glad to see all you faces out there. I'm glad you're enjoying your, uh, your pizza. I'm uh, Dr. Nathan Howell in the College of Engineering. I'm Associate Professor of Environmental Engineering and the Bell Helicopter uh, Professor of Engineering. And I would like to thank you for coming to this distinguished lecture series on confronting climate gridlock. Um, we're delighted to have you all in person, and for those of you that are here on YouTube Live, thank you for, for joining us as well. This is the final Distinguished Lecture Series event of Fall uh, 2023. And uh, I have a few people to acknowledge, or a few organizations. Uh, I'd like to acknowledge WT Administration for funding the DLS initiatives, uh, the, the actual DLS Committee of faculty, staff, and students for their diligence in reviewing and approving these events, and then uh, the specific uh, event sponsors, the Center for Studies of the American West, the WT Department of Life, Earth, and Environmental Sciences, uh, the WT College of Engineering, uh, and I would finally like to acknowledge uh, Burrowing Owl Books over in the corner, providing copies of Dr. Cohen's book, Confronting Climate Change for Sale, at this event, where you can obviously get a copy of the book and get Dr. Cohen to, to sign it for you. Um, uh, please join me in thanking all these organizations that made this event possible. Okay, and at this time, I'm going to invite uh, Dr. Pamela Lockwood, Professor of Mathematics and Associate Dean of the College of Engineering, to introduce our speaker for today. Thank you, Dr. Howell. Our distinguished lecturer today is Dr. Daniel Cohen, Associate Professor of Environmental Engineering, Rice University, Houston, Texas. His research specializes in the development of photochemical models and their application to air quality management, uncertainty principles, energy policy, and health impact studies. Before joining Rice, Dr. Cohen worked for the Air Protection Branch of the Georgia Environmental Protection Division. He received a BA in Applied Mathematics from Harvard University and a PhD in Atmospheric Chemistry from Georgia Tech and served as a Fulbright Scholar to Australia at the Cooperative Research Center for Southern Hemisphere Meteorology. Dr. Cohen is a recipient of the National Science Foundation Career Award and past member of the NASA Air Quality Applied Sciences team. As an educator, Dr. Cohen teaches several courses in his field at Rice. Just a couple of these we thought might interest you. Energy and the Environment, What are the Physical Principles of Energy, how do different energy sectors affect the environment, and what policies and technologies might lead to a more sustainable use of our energy resources. Solving the climate challenge, what are the conflicting visions presented by leading thinkers in framing the future of climate and energy? The course culminates with each student developing and representing a recommended approach for addressing the climate challenge. In addition to being an engineering teacher and scholar at Rice University's Department of Civil and Environmental Engineering, he is also an energy policy scholar at the James A. Baker III Institute for Public Policy. In this role, Dr. Cohen is frequently given the opportunity to write opinion and analysis articles in state and national media outlets such as The Conversation, The Hill, The Austin American Statesman, The Houston Chron Chronicle, and Bloomberg Government. Perhaps most notably to many of us, when the winter storm of 2021 froze virtually the entire state of Texas, it was Dr. Cohen and others like him that journalists and leaders approached with how our state could be unprepared for that kind of storm and what kind of energy resiliency our state needs to develop in order to weather these storms of the future. Thank you and help, help me welcome Dr. Daniel Cohen. So. So, so great to be here, really appreciate the warm welcome, appreciate the, the welcome and questions that I got from, from students in Dr. Howell's class, and really appreciate Dr. Howell uh, making all of this possible, really packing in a, a great day of meeting with undergraduates, with, with speaking to you now, with an evening event, and I insisted on being sure we made it out to, to Paladuro Canyon while I'm here, uh, probably my favorite state park that I've hiked in. So uh, it's a really pleasure to to be here with you. Um, and this is a talk about uh, confronting climate gridlock. This is a talk about solutions. Certainly happy to talk offline with people about, 
about the problem, about the fact that the world is warming, about, about uh, the science of it. As an atmospheric scientist, I can talk about that a long time. But this was a book that I went about writing in looking for how do we solve this challenge? How do we confront the climate gridlock? <clears throat> when it started out saying that I was an atmospheric scientist, I got used to hearing a lot of D words, and not just because my name is Daniel. Uh, but starting out teaching at Rice since 2006, um, it used to be that what I was worried about most is how do I deal with, with the denial, with the doubt, with uh, the skepticism, with the disinformation of people wondering uh, what is causing climate change? Is the world really warming? What, is it really our emissions that are causing it? And um, with time, I find that a lot of that uh, doubt has, has faded away. The world is continuing to warm faster than it ever has uh, before. And so a lot of that doubt has faded, especially with temperatures rising about two-tenths of a degree Celsius, or about a third of a degree Fahrenheit per decade, and getting ever so close to the, emission, to the temperature targets that were set in the Paris Agreement. So now that it's harder to deny that the world is warming and the science is getting more and more clear and more and more settled that we know why it is warming, I'm getting these sorts of Ds. Hearing the sense of doom, the sense of uh, depression. I was actually just at a book event. The author next to me is a uh, PhD psychologist who works with childhood trauma, childhood anxiety and depression disorders. She told me that the biggest thing that uh, teenagers are coming to her fearful about is how are they going to be growing up in a world that's warming so fast? Is this a threat to um, the future that we have? Is this something that, uh, that we should even be, be raising children in a future uh, like this with so much to be concerned about? Almost going pendulum is swung so far in the direction that now people realize the challenge and in some ways have set an overblown uh, fears and, and doom about what we might face. I saw that show up that uh, Dr. Howell and others put together a survey right here at West Texas A&M and actually got 150 people to respond. I think it was a mix of, of faculty and staff and students who responded and it shows this trend away from denial and towards this, this doom or despair in that the number who thought it was a hoax, only eight of you thought that, that climate change was a hoax, 99 out of the 150 thought it was a threat to the future of humanity. It is absolutely a threat, it is absolutely a concern. It is not something that is going to be the extinction of the human race. It is something that we can confront, it is a problem that we can solve, it's something that we need to be able to have hope in being able to address this challenge. And as you can see, the choice that I've made is that this isn't something that I need to be fearful of not raising children in it. My ch uh, children, Mira and Jacob, 15 and 12, years old have decided that it's something that we can address and that in fact they can have uh, a climate that is going to be warmer than the one that I grew up in, uh, but that can be a livable climate and have many things that actually get to a better point than where they are today um, in the future that they will inherit. That's not to downplay the problems that climate change causes. This is the range of impacts that the World Meteorological Organization points out that we need to be uh, concerned with that is making our agriculture have more challenges, is causing a threat to natural ecosystems, uh, is causing a threat to uh, sea level rise and so many other uh, ways in which this is a real problem. I'm not going to downplay that. Um, we know from our health experts that this is a threat to human health, that it worsens uh, some of the challenges that we face in terms of heat stroke, challenges we face in terms of adapting to uh, the smoke as wildfires increase, as we have more severe droughts in part of the country, the health threats that come from, from storms and floods. But in many ways, by addressing this problem, by slowing down, we won't be able to completely halt warming, but I am hopeful that by fo following some of the um, strategies that I outline in my book, we will be able to slow um, climate change, slow global warming, and in doing so, it's not just doing it for climate's sake, but it's doing it for so many other benefits that we can get in the process. So it's not just a matter of, is this something we should do for climate's sake, but our fossil fuel economy, our ways that we get energy today, which is still 
nearly 80% from fossil fuels. Both the US economy and the world economy are still nearly 80% fossil fuels. Even with all the transitions happening, even with the rapid growth of wind and solar and other resources, it's still a world that's mostly fossil fueled. And that's not just warming our climate, but it is a threat to air pollution and health. That's my core expertise as an atmospheric scientist, where the World Health Organization estimates that on the order of four to six million people a year are dying prematurely because of air pollution, mainly because of uh, fine particulate matter, PM 2.5, as well as ozone smog. That's something that if we move away from fossil fuels, even if the carbon dioxide keeps accumulating, the gases that make us sick, the particles that make us sick, can start being removed with lifetimes of weeks or months, and we can move to where my children are going to have cleaner air than I breathed growing up, and I was breathing cleaner air than my parents breathed. We have cleaner air in most of our cities of the United States, of Europe, of most of the developed world, cleaner air than our parents and grandparents breathed. And even in China, there's been a trend where China has started to control its local air pollution, not the pollution that's warming the planet, but the pollution that's hurting our health by moving in ways that bring down our carbon dioxide emissions. We're also continuing this trend towards cleaner and cleaner air that makes me very hopeful. We also have uh, enormous amounts of water use. Second to agriculture, the biggest use of water is for our thermal power plants. As we trend uh, to ways of making electricity that don't mean burning stuff, we will use less and less water. We'll have more and more water available for agriculture, for um, other domestic needs. And we have a world where energy poverty is a terrible problem worldwide. We're relying on inevitably scarce resources, fossil fuels that are ultimately limited, ultimately expensive, especially as Europeans are finding now, as their natural gas supplies have been constrained. And so we have a world economy today that is leaving uh, on the order of a billion people without reliable access to electricity, not just the problem that we had here in, in Texas, but, but around the year, that's a way of life of people in much of the world, not being able to count on electricity, not being able to afford the means of transportation that they want. So our fossil fuel present day is leaving people behind. By moving towards some of these strategies that I talk about in the book, we won't completely halt warming, but I'm confident that they are enough to keep warming below the two degree target that the Paris Agreement set. And by doing so, we will have cleaner air than we've had before, less water use, water that can clean up, return to the way it was uh, closer to natural conditions. And we need to do it in ways that aren't just expensive. It can't just be a matter of sacrifice. It can't be a matter of going to more and more expensive forms of energy, going to doing, uh, doing less, shivering our way, putting on the extra sweaters, doing what it means to uh, move to more expensive. Can't we just afford to pay more? We need to find ways that address climate change that makes energy more available, that makes energy more abundant, that has cleaner sources of energy that leave fewer people behind, have more equitable, more accessible energy for all the needs as, as people are trying to, to move out of some of the poverty that's such a problem around the world. So when people ask me, can we afford to confront climate change? Can we afford to confront climate gridlock? Can we afford to move from what had been uh, seemingly cheap fossil fuels to cleaner energy, I ask, can we afford not to? And I have the, the phrase that I put as the, the sort of credo at the start of the book, uh, the words of, of Rabbi Hillel, and if not now, when? If we're not going to address this now, when are we going to address it? With something that we're warming the world, uh, quickly approaching the Paris Agreement targets, this is something we need to address now. So what are we trying to address? What goals did we set? Well, the goals got set soon before I started writing this book in the 2015 Paris Climate Agreement is that the world finally got together with a set of targets and agreed what we were aiming for. Agreed that our goal is we'd like to hold warming to 1.5 degrees Celsius. Not so sure we can do that now that we're already zooming up to 1.2 degrees Celsius warming so far, but definitely want to keep it well below two degrees Celsius above pre-industrial levels. And the Paris Agreement, a lot of people know that temperature target, the net zero goal is actually part of the Paris Agreement too. It's that Article 4 of the Paris Agreement commits the world to aiming for net zero sometime in the second half of the 21st century. It leaves a lot of room for, for the exact time, but somewhere in there that's actually embedded in what 
uh, 197 countries around the world signed on and committed to doing this. And it took an approach of national commitments, is that we had, as I go through some of the history of this in chapter two of my book, there was a Kyoto Protocol that tried to get mandates of globally set what each country would do. It worked for stratospheric ozone depletion. It worked in the Montreal Protocol. It didn't work at Kyoto. Emissions kept going up. And so they tried a new approach at the Paris Agreement and said, we're not going to have diplomats in back rooms and Vice President Al Gore shuffling back and forth deciding. We're going to have everyone come to Paris already with their national strategy in hand, already with the plan of what are they going to do, national commitment, because we can't do it in a back room. We need each country's Congress and president or prime minister or um, parliament, whatever it is that makes decisions in that country, they're the only ones who can really say what they'll commit to, what they'll actually get behind, not like the broken promises that we had in Kyoto. And so they got together and did this, but they didn't do enough. Heading into that Paris Agreement, we were in a world where when climate scientists, this is Climate Action Tracker, has dozens of climate scientists who analyze the plans. When they looked at where we were before the Paris Agreement was signed, we were in this range of the world being headed towards three and a half or perhaps more degrees Celsius of warming, whatever that is, six or seven degrees Fahrenheit warming by the end of this century, and emissions would have continued, and so we actually would have continued warming beyond that, really catastrophic levels of warming that would be there. When you see some headlines, when you see some reporting, when you even see parts of the National Climate Assessment that came out in 2018, a lot of the worst case scenarios are still based on where we thought we were before the Paris Agreement. So always look under the hood. If you see something uh, that seems really, really dire, make sure is it still assuming that our business as usual, that our base case where we're heading is still three and a half, four degrees warming. I am hopeful we're not on that path. That's a path of the world doubling how much coal it uses today. That's a path where we keep increasing and increasing how much oil we use. We aren't on that path anymore. Solar and wind and batteries have gotten much cheaper than at this time. Auto companies, countries are starting to mandate and, and invest in um, cleaner vehicles. I think we're off of this trajectory of three and a half, four degrees warming. But when it came to the Paris Agreement, when they uh, did this and they put 1.5 degrees on the Eiffel Tower and when they all locked arms and sang kumbaya, they hadn't actually put their pledges where their policy was. They had this goal, but if you added up all of these national commitments, they didn't add up to one and a half or two degrees. Finally, since then, we've moved to where the pledges are starting to line up with where they need to be. And this was the update that climate action trackers, scientists and economists and policy analysts put out in November 2021 after the most recent follow-up to Paris. Every year there's a COP, a cl conference of the parties that follows up to the Paris Agreement. And the one that met in Glasgow, Scotland last year, countries came to it with better pledges. President Biden pledged that the United States would get to net zero by 2050 and get to a 50% cut from our peak levels by 2030. The European Union had similar targets. China said they would go carbon neutral by 2060. On and on, countries have pledged this. And so we've finally gotten to a point where the pledges are there, but they haven't backed that up with policies. If you look at what Congress has actually passed, if you look at what the EPA has actually done, if you look at all the equivalents around the world, our policies worldwide are only enough to flatline emissions. They're only enough to, to bend the curve, to stop being on this where we've got higher and higher, continually ever rising emissions. We're at a point where our policies are enough to get us to a plateau. We're not going to double our coal use going forward. We're not on a three and a half, four degree warming trajectory anymore. But this level of only slowly uh, having emissions come down is something that would leave us 2.5 to 2.9 Celsius warmer than we are today. And we wouldn't stop there. That's where the temperature would be in 2100. But notice that this is nowhere near net zero. Notice that this is still leaving us with over 30 billion tons a year of emissions that means that we would only be continuing to warm and warm and warm after 2100. So we're not in the very worst case, most catastrophic scenarios anymore, but this is not where we want to be. Where we finally are is that our pledges are finally getting to be almost enough. We're getting to the point where, if, where what we need most is to figure how is the US actually going to get that 50% cut by 2030, where we're on pace for about 40%. How are we actually going to get to net zero by 2050? How are the Europeans going to do it? How are the Chinese 
going to do it? Can we convince the Chinese to move up to 2050 like our pledge? Will we help India be able to have more affordable ways to get there? As Africa and Southeast Asia and other places develop, will they be able to leapfrog over the fossil fuel ways that we develop? Just like they've leapt over landlines and gone straight to mobile phones, will they be able to do that and bring things down? So can we get the pledges a little bit better? But right now the biggest problem is that we haven't put our policies where our pledges are. We haven't really pushed where that can go. So what will it take to get to, to this? Up the pledges a bit, but be sure that we're actually getting policies, getting it where we need to be. So my book lays out strategies for it. I didn't realize that there would be that Glasgow summit. I didn't realize that the pledges would get to where we need to be. But still, what we need to do in terms of the technologies we need to develop, and what we need to do in terms of bringing us towards cleaner energy, not just to address climate change, but realizing we have all these other priorities in mind for clean air, for addressing energy poverty, for making sure there's more affordable, more abundant energy for all. It's the same technologies that are there. This is laying out a pathway of where do we need to be heading towards 2050 and beyond. It's something that if you heard my background, you heard as training as an atmospheric scientist, my training um, in the air pollution arena, the climate science, it doesn't have all these aspects in the book. And so I went out and it was really a, a period of, of three years of intellectual discovery, of talking to over 100 people that once they heard I was writing this book were able to take, give me the time to talk to me. Diplomats, international relations scholars, economists, policy makers, policy advisors, uh, people who were out there in the business world, people who have developed new uh, technologies, people who are putting those technologies into practice, people who were trying and failing. The first interview I had was of someone who wanted to build power lines connecting windy, the windiest areas of the Oklahoma Panhandle with Tennessee, saw him close his company over the course of researching the book because he wasn't able to get the local approvals. Whereas was able to see another person I profile in the book go from being just fresh out of UT Austin Business School to now getting nearly $200 million in venture capital funding and contracts with Google and with California power uh, buyers, getting his geothermal company off the ground. So getting a sense, even just in the course of researching this, of what's going on in the marketplace, what's going on, the technologies that we need and the challenges, realizing that there is still a lot of gridlock facing people who are trying to address this. I laid the book out with these three keys to addressing it. The reason why I chose these is because they interact with each other, is that if we leave out diplomacy, then we won't have that crucial um, way of driving policy. A lot of the policies when President Biden said he wants this target by 2030 and target by 2050, he's aligning that with what we agreed to in 2015 in the Paris Agreement. So it's driving the policies of the government, it's driving the policies of businesses. More and more businesses, cities, states, other countries are aligning their targets based on what was set in diplomacy in the Paris Climate Agreement. And policy is needed to drive diplomacy, is that every year, and actually the world is meeting uh, this month in uh, Egypt for the, the latest follow-up agreement, we don't have any credibility, we don't have any clout, we don't have any way of pushing other countries to do more if we aren't enacting domestic policy to drive that forward. Diplomacy and technology are crucial because we are going to need the whole world's effort. We're going to need engineers and scientists and uh, social scientists, uh, all of us need to be on board around the world to drive these technologies forward as quickly as they can. And technology makes diplomacy possible because countries only agreed to the Paris Agreement because they thought there were pathways to get clean energy fast enough to meet those targets. If solar hadn't become cheap, if wind wasn't becoming cheap, if we didn't think batteries were developing, we never would have agreed to something that was putting our people into poverty, that was putting us into a world where we would have had to do less and less. People, diplomats, everyone realizes we need to do more than just address climate change. We need to meet the needs of society. Better technologies allows diplomats and world leaders to agree to tougher policies. And then technology and policy are closely intertwined know this from my time working in state government and advising state governments and now serve on the board of scientific counselors for the US EPA, that we have this saying that regulation uh, drives innovation. That I was giving the example to Dr. Howell's class today of when, whenever we think that, that it can't be done, when we haven't tried to do it, and we say, can we do a regulation that the industry usually estimates costs will be up here, the regulators think it'll cost 
here, but when we actually have to do it, when you aren't just writing white papers and doing spreadsheets, but you actually have to go out there and try to make a profit or minimize your cost of doing something, the costs end up being way lower than you actually thought. So this need that once you have to do something, once you have policy there, you find ways to make profit. And I'm hopeful that with the new policies that Congress has enacted recently, industry is going to innovate to find ways to take advantage of these policies. And as technology innovates, we can make more stringent policies to go along with it. I lay out, so what technologies do we need? Well, I lay out the chapters of my book in line with the technologies that we need. That we need to control other greenhouse gases, we need ways to remove carbon from the atmosphere. Those are in some ways second, those are absolutely essential, but they're in some ways secondary to the fact that over 80% of the world's greenhouse gas emissions are coming from burning fossil fuels. And we're burning fossil fuels where over 35 billion tons a year of CO2 are coming out of them. So we cannot, there's no way we can have sinks get us to 35 billion tons a year. The most ambitious ideas for sinks are one or two or three billion tons each. So carbon sinks are important. We can't get to net zero without some way to offset our emissions, but that's going to come later to have a big role of that. Yes, we need to control methane leaks and nitrous oxide emissions and CFCs that have already been banned, but if we only do that, we're still going to warm well, well beyond two degrees. So the central pillars of the book, what I focus the most of my attention on and what ties in most to my research, where as you heard, I've done research on the electric grid, research on ways that we can transition to clean electricity, researching ways that we can move towards cleaner vehicles. The central heart of it all is how do we move to cleaner energy. Those three pillars that we need, efficiency, clean electricity, and then electrification and switching to other forms of clean fuels and clean electricity. Why do we need these three pillars? Well, without efficiency, our whole problem will be too large to address. We need to shrink the problem. We need to shrink down that 35 billion tons a year, that four and a half tons per person a year of emissions, because yeah, it's down to four and a half tons. We're, uh, those of you who don't know, this is the month that the world is expected to hit eight billion people in population. So if we don't have ways of being more efficient with our energy use, we're not going to be able to have enough materials, enough uh, solar farms, wind farms. It's that much, we can't uh, have the resources to build twice as much just because we're wasting energy. We're not going to be able to bring more people into access to clean energy, access to electricity, to, to energy at all, if we can't work in more efficient ways. So that's absolutely crucial. We need clean electricity to make it make sense to switch to electricity. Why would we be using electric cars? Why would we be using heat pumps? Why would we electrify our industry if it's being used coal and natural gas electricity? Yes, there is still a little bit of a benefit to electric cars, even if they're run off of coal electricity. But we can get much, much cleaner. We can get much, much better. We can reduce emissions much more deeply if we clean up electricity globally. Power plants are the biggest source of our emissions. In the US, they're number two. They recently got passed by vehicles. But we're probably going to need to at least double the amount of electricity that we use in the future if we want to make everything else happen. So the single most important pillar, the single most uh, amount of emission reduction we'll get will be by moving to clean electricity. We need to electrify in order to be more efficient. There's only so efficient that an internal combustion engine can be. There's only so efficient that a furnace can be in burning fuel oil or propane or natural gas. You can be at least twice as efficient with an electric motor or a hydrogen fuel cell as you can with a gasoline or diesel engine. You can be three times or more efficient with a heat pump, an electric heat pump, than you can be with a furnace. Industrial processes can be made more efficient with electricity. So electrification is crucial to efficiency itself. And then how we electrify can either make it easier or make it harder to move to clean electricity. I have electrified in a dumb way. My wife and I each have electric cars. We plug it in and it charges us up whenever we need to. That might be at the times when the grid is having the most scarce electricity. Yes, we have the solar panels on our roof, but still we might be charging up when the sun is uh, setting, when the winds are slow. Can we have chargers that sense what the grid needs and make it easier to integrate more clean energy sources onto the grid? Smart chargers are available to do that. And then off the chart of this is that we're going to need enormous amounts of clean electricity, probably two or three times what we produce today, 
to not only power those electric cars, but also the other things we need. If we want to have carbon sinks, if we want to have those big direct air capture carbon sucking fans, where Texas is actually taking the lead, Occidental Petroleum is working with carbon engineering to build the first ever large scale carbon capture device actually in the Permian Basin. Those need enormous amounts of electricity. So this idea that we can just choose, oh, well, we don't need to clean up. We don't need to go to wind and solar and geothermal and nuclear and hydro and whatever else. We can just capture it later. Well, you can't capture it without unbelievably large amounts of energy, without hundreds of acres of solar or wind or something to power every single one of those direct air capture facilities. It's not an either or. It's a definitely need clean energy. Maybe we need a bit of the direct air capture or other technologies after that. People say, oh, well, maybe we don't need electric cars, maybe we need hydrogen fuel cells. Well, that's electric too, because the only way that we can get to very large scales and very clean ways of making hydrogen is making it with clean electricity splitting water. So inevitably, we need these pillars to tie together. There are pessimists who say we can't get there. Um, you know, very smart people, uh, Vaslav Smil, who's the favorite um, economists listened to by Bill Gates and others. Others are pessimistic. They say it took 50 to 100 years to make every energy transition that we've made in the past. We had a decarbonized economy already. We had a renewable resource, a wood-based, biomass-based economy, where in the first 100 years of our nation, we were mostly uh, wood and biomass and water-powered economy. It took us 50 to 100 years for coal to replace that. It took another 50 to 100 years for oil and natural gas to dethrone coal as the leading source of energy in our economy. How do we think that by 2050, we can have a mostly clean energy economy? Things haven't moved that fast before. But if you look at individual technologies, not the entire coal or the entire oil or the entire natural gas, when a technology is better than what's before, when it's better and cheaper than what came before it, we move very quickly to it when cars were developed, when, self, when uh, telephones were developed, when black and white TVs were developed. Those can be adopted 10, 15 years time. You see them take these S curves of very, very rapid adoption and become where they're the norm across society. Once color TVs came away, we junked our black and white TVs and those became ubiquitous across American households. So we need to be able to move on these sorts of scales of very rapid adoption. And if we do this technology by technology, then we can get to where we need to be, classic example is the way we carbonized the economy worked in this way. If you looked at uh, downtown New York uh, in 1900, you would see only car, you would see only horses, horses and buggies moving people around. If you went just 13 years later, it was only cars, the horses had all been sent out to pasture or, or worse, unfortunately. 13 years is the exact amount of time that California is giving the auto industry to move to completely zero emissions vehicles. They are going to, uh, if they stick with this policy that they enacted, ban, elect ban uh, gasoline and diesel engines for, uh, for passenger vehicles in just 13 years time, the exact same pace of transition here. It's the same pace that European Union that other countries are adopting of how quickly enormous speed to this transition that's underway. This may seem too fast, but we've always underestimated the ability of clean energy before. This shows what the smartest people at the International Energy Agency thought would be the pace at which we adopted solar year after year, that it kept getting more and more solar. And they said, okay, well, that was just a fluke. We just had something that happened unusual and we had a burst. We, we assume that the amount we add each year is just going to flatline again. Well, the actual amount that we've added each year of solar has continued to be more and more and more beyond what was thought would be done. The reason for that is because solar has become cheaper than we ever thought it would be. This is what the forecasts were in 2010, is that they've got some really smart economists, they've got some really smart energy scholars at the International Energy Agency. They knew that technologies, the more that we use them, the cheaper they can get. So they knew that when electricity from solar cost over 35 cents a kilowatt hour, a few years after I began teaching my energy course at Rice, this is what I was, was going with, is how expensive solar was. They were smart and they knew the cost could come down. They were so ambitious, they thought the cost could come down to 11 cents by 2050. And then costs got cheaper and cheaper, so by 2014 they lowered their curve here. At the same time, you had Ramez Nam, okay, uh, really uh, uh, 
innovative thinker futurist doing these wild pie in the sky dreams of how fast he thought we could move to clean electricity. So he had these curves that were more ambitious than the IEA. He thought we could get solar this cheap. And then you actually look at what's happened in the marketplace. If you carry this forward, solar now, before you count the ta tax subsidies, before you count the credits, just the unsubsidized cost of solar is now three cents a kilowatt hour. Okay, a third or less of the cost that IEA thought we might be able to get to by 2050. How did we get there? Well, we got there by learning by doing. One of my favorite interviews among the 100 for this book was talking to a professor, Greg Nemet, at the University of Wisconsin at Madison, who wrote an entire book about how solar became cheap. And something they call Swanson's Law. You might have heard something similar, similar concept to what you've had with, with computer chips, how computer chips keep getting smaller and faster and more affordable per unit of computing. Well, we see this with a variety of clean energy Technology. You see it with a variety of technologies overall. If you look, if you plot a path of how fast Model Ts and other cars were adopted, they followed these same learning curves where the more you do something, the better you get at doing it, the more affordably you're able to do it as you move forward. And they found that for each doubling of deployment, you can get 20% or more reductions in cost. And so we go from deployment that was on just a few panels on satellites to the little solar that I had in my TI-34 calculator growing up to having it at larger and larger scales to Japan and Germany and China subsidizing their solar industries, that you kept being able to have lots and lots of doublings and you double things enough and you cut things 20% at a time enough and enough and you have an exponential decline in costs. And what Professor Nemet and other technology scholars have been able to find is that these are driven by two main things. They're driven by a push from new technologies. We need these technologies to exist. But really the technology is mainly what came out of Bell Labs in the 1950s in the case of solar. And what's even more important is you need a market demand pull. You need to say, if you build it, we will come. We will buy what you produce. And so those uh, carrots and sticks and any range of policies that can get us, anything that will get us that pull to know that we have that demand can drive the deployment. So I like to visualize it uh, in this way and appreciate uh, Donnie Soward from a graphic designer in, in our engineering office for helping me create this this graphic is really what drove those cost curves of getting from high cost to low cost at more and more deployment, needs a technology push, needs the research and development and the initial demonstration projects that make the technologies available. Um, but then just as importantly or more importantly, we need a demand pull. And that by doing this, this becomes self-reinforcing. Is that once you get the cost down, then you don't need all those policies anymore. You can get the marketplace wanting it because this is just the cheapest and best technology there is. Wind and solar are now the cheapest ways of making electricity that we've ever had for making electricity in human history. And so if these are the pushes and pulls, what's motivating here, and what I pointed out to the classroom today, is that all of the actions that we take, all of what we choose to do, ourselves and as a country is not just reducing our own emissions, but if we can help do this in ways if we're choosing the most uh, innovative technologies, the technologies that most need to be developed and are able to bring up deployments, we not only reduce our own emissions, we have huge leverage. We can act in ways, as a nation we need to act in ways that not only cut US emissions, cut our personal emissions, but if we do it with technologies that are innovative, we can make them more affordable so that they'll want to be deployed all around the world. The push can come from, from R&D, through our advocacy, through our votes, through choosing careers in technology. The purchases we make, the policies, the advocacy can help drive that demand pull, insisting that the companies we work for choose the clean options that help get these deployments moving forward. So what technologies do we need to drive forward? Well, one of the key areas is for that central pillar of clean electricity. Wind and solar are already cheap. So for those, it's deploy, deploy, deploy as much as we can. We need to balance them with something because it's not windy all the time, it's not sunny all the time. And so some mix of battery storage, of hydro, of nuclear, of geothermal, we don't need all of them, but we need some combination of them that gives us uh, firm and flexible sources. And the more that we're able to build things in this country again, moving beyond uh, the failure that I saw interviewing Michael Skelly, who was unable to build power lines, the more that we can build those, the easier it is to blend the other technology resources. Um, and hopeful that lithium ion batteries are following the same curve that solar P 
panels have. That's going to make it easier to decarbonize the grid. That's going to make it easier to move to electric vehicles. We need to decarbonize heat. So our second biggest source of, of emissions worldwide is from a variety of industries. There are lots of different industries, but the bottom line is that they all need a lot of heat to make steel, to smelt aluminum, to make glass. And so we need to find ways to decarbonize that either with electricity or with hydrogen made from electricity, variety of approaches, but somehow we need technologies that make industry cleaner. And for our homes and businesses, our main direct use of emissions, our main direct emissions in our homes and businesses comes from burning uh, natural gas or fuel oil or propane to heat our air and to heat our water. And both water and air can be heated three to four times as efficiently if we transition to electric heat pumps. And that electricity can be made cleaner than it is today with wind or solar or nuclear or geothermal or whatever it may be, whereas natural gas and propane and fuel, uh, fuel oil can never be made much cleaner than they are today, at least not at scale. We also need technologies for making hydrogen more cleanly, whether that's from electricity or whether it's from ca capturing the carbon of, uh, of the ways that we make hydrogen from natural gas today. And then we can use those clean forms of hydrogen to make clean synthetic fuels, sometimes called electrofuels. If you use electricity to make the hydrogen, and you use the hydrogen to make fuels like methane or methanol or ammonia, that could be ways that we can power our planes, our ships, that it's not going to be possible to electrify uh, intercontinental planes or intercontinental ships, but uh, hydrogen-derived fuels, cleanly produced fuels, uh, advanced biofuels provide a way of, of meeting those difficult to decarbonize. Sectors, we need to make agriculture cleaner, is that uh, over 10% of emissions come from agriculture, here I show a picture that of a paper just published with, with my PhD student, Lena Luo, where we show that both large amounts of air pollution and large amounts of nitrous oxide, a greenhouse gas 270 times as potent as CO2, are coming from fertilized agriculture in the United States. We need to look at strategies where we're using uh, fertilizers more efficiently and using them in ways that put less of that nitrogen into the air. And then finally, and this is the last, uh, and I should, it is sort of the least in a way because this only becomes important once we can shrink down the 35 billion tons of emissions. Only when we get it down to the single digits can we really even hope to offset it with sinks. But yes, we can't get to net zero without something being negative to offset it. So there are a range of different ways that we can move uh, to negative emissions uh, technologies, whether in technological approaches, direct air capture, pulling it out of the air, uh, bioenergy, carbon capture and storage, or adding more forests and finding ways to take up more carbon into our forests and our soils. Fortunately, we have efforts underway. This is just a, a smattering of what the Department of Energy is already pursuing, is they are already aligning their efforts to address the, carb the, the pillars of clean energy that I pointed out, is that uh, efforts to, uh, for industrial heat, for hydrogen, we have a new grant that we just received where we're starting over the next year or two to look at opportunities for geothermal. Uh, Secretary Jennifer Granholm of the Department of Energy's uh, secretary just came uh, to Rice uh, last month to announce a new target for how uh, affordable she wants enhanced geothermal to become uh, and looking at carbon negative technologies. All of these crucial that as the wealthiest countries on earth, we're deriving the technology innovation and if those demand pulls come with it, can make these more affordable for everyone to use. And so that's why I come away from this hopeful. I come away from this not regretting my choice to be raising my children in this world that is warming, but where we can slow the warming. In a world where in doing the things that we need to do to confront climate gridlock, we can actually have a better future, a cleaner future, cleaner air, cleaner water, and more abundant energy that can be more accessible to people not just around this country, but around the world. And so I'm hopeful for that, and I really welcome the questions that you have uh, for me today. It's time for the questions here. Thank you, Dr. Cohen, for sharing all your experience on uh, climate gridlock and solutions to climate change. Uh, we'll take questions at this time from uh, the audience. Uh, if you have a question, just come on up to the mic here. They're both live. And uh, we also can take questions via the YouTube live stream. Uh, those of you that are on that, you can type those questions in 
and Dr. Eric Crossman in the back is, is going to be moderating and sharing those questions. He'll read out what you have, and he may you know, shorten it if it's a little long or something like that. Uh, but in general, uh, we just ask keep your questions brief so there's enough time for everyone to ask the question then and get an opportunity. Uh, and try and take your thought as much as possible and then convert it into an actual question. You can start with a statement, but make sure there's a clear question in it when you get uh, to the end point there. So, thank you. And we'll, we'll, we'll take that for several minutes here. So you mentioned that an increase in that demand on the consumer side, I imagine, is necessary to drive costs down. Mm -hmm. I was curious if that cost is cost put on suppliers, or would it be cost that is seen by the demand? Yeah, I'm talking about the cost of <coughs> of these technologies, the cost of um, the cost of making a solar panel, the cost of of making and deploying a wind turbine, the cost of of making a lithium ion battery has, has continued with, with the more and more that we've done it, uh, the more and more that the costs come down. Um, you're right, there are, there are costs beyond uh, the direct costs. There are costs of the pollution of some of the materials resources that go in, but, but all of that is actually able to come down with it, is that we've been able to make solar panels thinner. We've been able to make lithium ion batteries using less uh, rare uh, materials, using less, le less uh, lithium, less cobalt. So often with, with the innovations that come, we actually reduce a lot of the environmental footprints that come while also reducing the costs of these technologies. So all that re can really come together. I know there are more questions. I got about 10 questions in, uh, in the fluids class alone. Yep. Thank you for an excellent presentation on climate change and its solutions. My question is, Given the challenges of climate change and the greenhouse gases, do you think that what are the opportunities for us, the, the scientists who are involved in agriculture, how we are going to feed the growing population at global level? Thank mm -hmm. you. Yeah, so with, with 8 billion people to feed, um, absolutely crucial. We need to be acting in ways that, that expand the food supply rather than seeing it as some trade-off between addressing climate change and agriculture. Um, and agriculture is threatened by climate change, is that we have more intense droughts, we have uh, rainfall coming in more intense ways, so we need, we need to address climate change. We need to, to drastically slow the pace of warming so that farmers can adapt to the warming uh, that continues. Um, agriculture plays a crucial role. It's uh, on the order of an eighth of all emissions. Mainly it's coming from uh, nitrous oxide, which is so potent, as well as the methane that comes from, from livestock and, and rice paddy. So, so the, the nitrogen is something that's, that's very dear to me, because I would say that uh, about half of the, the scientific research, the papers, the, what doesn't show up in the book, but, but what keeps my uh, PhD students occupied and keeps us in the papers is, is looking at ways specifically to reduce the, the nitrous oxide and, and associated nitrogen air pollutants that come out of soils. I think there are a lot of great ways to do that. Uh, we can be a lot smarter in finding ways to, to use less uh, fertilizer or use the right type of fertilizer in the right place at the right time. That not only reduces the nitrous oxide, but it's one of the biggest consumers of natural gas is to make the ammonia that goes into fertilizer. So you get a win-win-win situation is if we're smarter about how we use fertilizer, then we need less natural gas to go into it at the factories. We have less nitrous oxide greenhouse gas. We have less NOx and ammonia that form particulate matter. Some studies show that, that agricultural emissions have become the leading source of PM 2.5 in parts of the US that have cleaned up their fossil fuel emissions. So absolutely finding ways to, to work with farmers, find ways that we do this with, without sacrificing crop yields or even growing crop yields, finding ways to to have livestock raised in ways that, that have less, less methane emissions associated with it, uh, absolutely crucial that agriculture be a part of the solution. Uh, Dr. Crossman has a question from YouTube Live, so go ahead. Okay, great, you, thank you very much. And just a little background as far as, uh, for our speaker that, uh, that Randall County here is uh, Canyon, our university is in Randall County. And the question from online is, according to the 21 Yale Climate Opinion Map, 
Only 42% in Randall County know most scientists think global warming is happening. What is the role of education in fighting climate gridlock? Mm -hmm. Yeah, um, always disappointing to hear that there is still so much either misinformation or, or unawareness of, of what's there. Um, that image that I showed early on of, you know, thermometers don't lie. Um, the temperatures are warming at, at a pace that's never been been seen before, and we know from the climate science um, what's causing it. There, yeah, it's the more that we can do as educators, the more that we can do to make people aware of the warming, make people aware of the causes, make people aware of the of the impacts without going too far. Without I'm someone who's not an alarmist or a doomist of saying this is the end of the world, but realizing that there are real problems, not existential or extinction level uh, problems, but very big challenges to society that come with this and knowing the cause is, is important. I would also say that, that to some extent we can act in way that education is a big piece, it's not the only piece, is that some surveys that I've seen show a much higher level of people think that we should regulate and reduce and control carbon dioxide emissions than accept that carbon dioxide is warming the planet. I, I don't understand how you do that. Like, why care about carbon dioxide if you don't accept that it's warming the planet? But there actually is support for making things cleaner, for reducing emissions. There is support, um, there's bipartisan support of over 80% for making it more affordable to have wind and solar and other forms of, of clean energy. So I think there can be bipartisan support. I would love if that happened with better understanding of the science too, but some of the, there is a lot of support for climate solutions, even higher levels of support than, uh, than the science acceptance might lead you to believe. Good afternoon. Uh, I'm Anir Ben Paul from the College of Engineering. Um, so one, the one way that I see that you're trying to reduce the impact is by uh, trying to create a market force from consumers, everyday consumers, to uh, provide more cleaner energy sources and so on. Uh, were you ha did you have a chance to interview, let's say, uh, big corporation representatives with respect to how they can play a role? Constrained corporations can play a huge role in dictating policies and government. So uh, are individual cons consumers, how much of an impact can individual consumers have versus corporations who are also uh, consumers of all kinds mm. and producers of all kinds of energy? So do you think the individual consumers can have as big of an impact as corporations can have, mm -hmm. considering they might not have children to worry about, right? Mm -hmm. They are considering five-year plans right. or 10-year plans, so they, I don't know if they're thinking 100 years into the future. Sure. Um, so it's been amazing just over the course of the time that I was researching the book to see that corporations upped their ambition, upped their climate commi commitments, moved more in depth into what's the buzzword is ESG, environments, uh, social and governance. Um, and um, you had this huge move. It was uh, one of the movements, there's an RE100 movement and there's a uh, we are still in movement that happened when President Trump uh, temporarily pulled us out of the Paris Agreement, is that you had hundreds and hundreds of companies, including some of the biggest ones, pledged to go net zero or pledged to take all sorts of steps and, and often had climate action plans for their companies, I, I think a big part of that happening was because they were listening to their consumers and they were listening to some of the, the urgency of people saying that they wanted and, and knew it was a good marketing to be able to say that their corn chips or their widgets or their whatever was made with 100% clean electricity. I think that, that part of why Tim Latimer, who I profile in the book, was able to make his business move is because Google made a commitment and Google did it, I assume because their employees and their customers said they wanted cleaner data centers and cleaner uh, production and, and that drove the demand for it. So I think consumers and companies are, are inevitably tied together because companies want to make, uh, want to market themselves and buy it. I think we need to be careful, we need to insist on that companies are acting beyond just greenwashing to be sure that when companies are making pledges going, when they say they're going to get to net zero by by whatever future year, that, that there be some accountability, that we make sure it's being done in ways that that it happens, but I'm, I'm very hopeful about how that's done. I think some of the, the biggest companies, the, the Googles and the Apples and the Microsofts are actually doing it in more ambitious ways, insisting on 
that clean energy coming locally, that clean energy coming in 24-7, in uh, not just offsetting everything by a bunch of solar farms in Saudi Arabia or something, but, but really getting localized, round-the-clock sources. I, I see a lot of that is driving the marketplace, is driving demand of, of letting us have geothermal that costs twice what solar and wind do today and letting it scale up to bring that down. So I, I've been very encouraged what's happened over the past five years. Dr. Crossman has another question from the back on YouTube. Yep, so a question from YouTube. Uh, what is your opinion about geoengineering? Are we at the point we really need to think about the option of messing with our mother nature and physically cooling the planet? And a second, along with that, is any policy effort for geoengineering that you are aware of? Yeah, so with geoengineering, there's um, National Academies, uh, National Academies of Science put together a panel on geoengineering, and they, they split themselves into two ways. They were looking at both, but I think they, they decided that there are two very different things. One way of geoengineering is engineering we do to remove carbon dioxide from the atmosphere. And I think technologies, we make sure that we're doing that in a right way. We make sure we aren't having unintended consequences from spills or localized problems. If we can do technologies that pull carbon dioxide from the atmosphere, we make the Earth closer to its natural state. We're directly offsetting the CO2 that we're putting up there. The, the more concern that I and others have is, is if we're talking about geoengineering as in shooting uh, aerosols or sulfur or iron or particles into the stratosphere where you end up reflecting away sunlight to uh, offset heat. Um, I'm hopeful that we can slow global warming enough, we can slow greenhouse gases enough that that, that won't be um, won't be necessary. Um, I think it, it's a really tough set of challenges. I do think that it's not something that we should be deploying yet. We're not at a point, I think, where it makes sense to do it. Um, to some extent, research makes sense. It, it would be a more affordable way, and I think some of the fears that are out there, I, I think it can be done without hurting the stratospheric ozone layer, for example, for, for some details of the way that chemistry works. Um, it, it is the cheapest way to, to bring down temperatures. It, it opens a Pandora's box. I think what concerns me is that, um, you know, it's kind of like uh, like what nuclear weapons did um, when they uh, came about in the 1940s. It puts more power into <clears throat> fewer people's hands than has ever been before because it probably would only take tens of billions of dollars a year to, uh, you know, change the world's temperature to cool it by half a degree Celsius by, by a degree Fahrenheit. So you're putting it within the reach of, you know, a mid-sized country or in the reach of Elon Musk and Jeff Bezos. Uh, that sort of level of deciding how they want to reset the global thermostat. As much as humans are, are raising the temperature, it's something that collectively eight billion people over the course of decades are slowly warming the planet. Do we want to be developing technologies and ways that that someone who wants things to be cooler could could do that, and some it's not going to get us back to a natural climate. It's going to, to reset the global temperature, but with more scattered light, with a shift in the jet streams, with some places will get wetter, some will get drier. We can't really predict who are the winners and losers. <clears throat> the idea that for tens of billions of dollars a year, you could have that kind of power um, is, I think, not just a, as an engineer, as a scientist, I can tell you we can do it without destroying the ozone layer. I can tell you, I think it's engineering physically possible, but I think it's a question for for policy, for philosophy, for theology, for governance, for diplomacy. How do we how do we deal with that sort of thing? I think is, is beyond just what as a scientist I can say what 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 should happen on that. Thank you. Yeah, we just got time for one more, so you can go and that'll have to be it. How's it going? Uh, so you said uh, California and other countries are transitioning uh, around 13 years, right? And I think other states are going to follow with that. What's your take on, you know, middle class or low class society, and uh, you know the expenses on, you know, let's say a vehicle is 50, 50 grand now for an EV, and where you can buy another vehicle for a thousand dollars or something cheap, you know. So do you see a big effect on, you know, lower and middle class society on where they, it might be more difficult for them to make that transition? Yeah, um, I think we need to make it <clears throat> more affordable than gasoline and diesel cars have been. The, the main cost of a electric car is the batteries. And so we need 
engineers, we need scientists, we need innovators, we need government funding, and we need the demand that as more of these come, I'm hopeful that these curves keep following the sorts of curves that solar and wind were, where if you can bring down the cost of the battery, electric cars can be cheaper. They, they need, you know, they have 100 fewer moving parts. They can be cheaper to maintain. They're cheaper to operate. We need to be sure that we're making clean electricity in ways that actually make electricity more affordable than it's been, so they're more affordable to operate. Um, and I think if we do it in the right way, it's actually going to make transportation more accessible to more people. Yeah, I'm not advocating that, that we should only have cars that cost $50,000, which are out of reach for a lot of people, but I think if done right, I think it's, it's like that, how expensive we thought other scrubbers, other clean technologies would be in the past, where I think when there is that mandate in California, there's mandates in Europe, there's mandates coming in other parts of the world, when companies actually have to do it, they're going to find ways to do it and find ways to make it affordable for, for consumers. So I'm, I'm hopeful we're on the right trajectory for that and that the future of electric car, what's actually in the showrooms in 2035 is not gonna look just like luxury vehicle options that it is today. Well, that's all the time we have. Can y'all give uh, Dr. Cole one more round of applause, please? <laughs> <laughs> And that, that concludes the uh, event for today. Please, uh, uh, Vicki, okay, do we have more pizza in the back? Take a box. And, 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 then, and then Burrowing Owl is also in the corner with some of uh, Dr. Cohen's books there for, for sale. You can pick one up on your way out, and Dr. Cohen will be over there to talk to you more at length and to sign your book if you would like. So thank you again. <laughs>